I think we'll go ahead and get started. I'm uh, Connie Vayette, the director of the Rethinking U.S. Foreign Assistance Program here at the Center for Global Development, and um, so happy that uh, we have so many morning people here, or else you're not morning people and you just dragged yourselves out. But either either way, we're very appreciative, very appreciative that you're here. Um, the Rethinking U.S. Foreign Assistance uh, Program. Uh, follows all things about aid reform and aid effectiveness, and it, it actually evolved from uh, the creation of the MCA monitor, um, and um, I think you've all been following that pretty intensely. Um, we also have uh, a sister monitor, the USAID monitor, as part of uh, the Rethinking program. So, uh, so we hope to, to keep up uh, lots of activities uh, following both MCC and, and USAID and other uh, types of aid programs across government. Um, we love input, so uh, anything that you think that we should be covering more or, or maybe not covering the way you'd like to see it, please feel free to talk to me later or send us an email. Um, so today, uh, Casey and Owen are going to present their latest paper on the MCC selection process. This is uh, an annual event um, and is uh, usually pretty well received. Um, this report is very timely for a number of reasons. Uh, one, the MCC board is meeting in two days' time to actual to do the official selection. Uh, so this is always a fun exercise for us to see if uh, if what uh, we have what we think is going to happen actually happens. Um, uh, secondly, uh, within this time of budget austerity, MCC is going to have to exercise even more selectivity. Uh, we advocate more selectivity across the board uh, with aid programs, but uh, MCC, uh, you know, may end up with less than $900 million this year in the FY12 appropriations. Uh, so they're going to have to be very careful about how they uh, choose which countries to make investments in. Uh, we were hoping to actually have some budget numbers this morning, but the Appropriations Committee did not file last night as they had promised us. So we're, uh, we hope to have uh, something uh, today, unless Larry's been given insider information. He's laughing, so no. Okay. <laughs> So um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Casey. Oh, I also want to mention that we've had uh, some friends, MCC friends, flying in from Honduras. So uh, welcome to, to CGD again. Um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Casey, who is um, a policy analyst with Rethinking, and Owen, who is a research assistant here at CGD. And they're going to present uh, the paper and the findings, and then we're going to open it up to a conversation. So with that, I'll give it over to you. So thank you all again so much for coming. Um, this is the ninth year that the MCC has done selection and the ninth year that the MCA monitor has covered it. Um, as you hopefully know, our, our role here is to, to provide um, in-depth analysis on the indicators, do a breakdown, and then offer our predictions on the countries that we think the MCC will make um, compact and, and um, threshold eligible. Again, these are only predictions. This is not what the MCC board will necessarily do, so um, I would remind you, yes, these are only a forecast of um, what is I'm going to happen. So there are some exciting highlights that are unique to this year. There is a revamped um, um, threshold program. About a year ago, the MCC launched a new threshold program that was designed to change the focus from moving the needle on the on individual indicators in a country to more policy reforms and these policy reforms would be identified through constraints to growth analysis and you'll recognize this analysis as the same diagnostic tool that's used in compacts and so the advantage here is that the new threshold program is also um, going to offer more information on the partnership um, potential of a country it's <laughs> the event has started you can turn alarms off um, Seriously. Um, so yes, and so uh, last year the MCA monitor 
advocated for the MCC to choose at least one country to pilot the new program, and they chose no countries. So this year, it's, um, it's ready to roll as a new program and a new tool for the MCC. The second big change this year is second compact eligibility. Seven compacts have now um, been completed, and three more are, are due to close in the following year. That's a total of, of 10 countries that are now seeking second compacts. This in, as Connie said, an extremely tight um, um, budget environment. So it's going to be an interesting dynamic with the board trying um, to balance a compact pipeline with far less resources. And finally, the thing that I'm sure you all have heard about is there's um, a brand new indicators system. And I'd like to go into that a little bit more right now. You'll all recognize the old indicators um, system. It's 17 indicators across three policy categories. And the rules were that a country had to pass at least three indicators in each of the categories and the control of corruption hard hurdle. This year, there are new indicators, new, new thresholds, and um, a change in the rules. And I'll, I'll run through these very quickly. So instead of the voice and accountability indicator, it's been replaced with the new freedom of information indicator in the ruling justly category. In the economic freedom category, two new indicators have been added, the access to credit indicator and the gender in the economy indicator. The investing in people category has been expanded from five indicators to six indicators, but it's not actually a new indicator. These two new indicators, the natural resource protection and the child health, are actually subcomponents of the formal of the former natural resource management indicator. So basically it's been broken in half and made um, to be two new indicators. Also, I'd like to highlight there are two new rules that um, apply to lower middle income countries only. So you'll recognize the girls' um, primary education completion rate indicator, which remains for the low income countries. But now, for lower middle income countries, it's a girls' secondary enrollment rate indicator. And this was in recognition of the fact that many of the lower middle income countries had reached a threshold on the primary education that was considered extremely successful. And so the MCC wanted to then raise the bar for these group of countries to achieve more and better. Same with immunization rates. There's in, um, instead of a median um, um, threshold now, it's an absolute threshold. So what that means is for lower middle income countries only, they have to be above 90% for immunization rates, and that's considered passing the threshold. There's also two new absolute th um, thresholds for the political rights and the civil liberties indicators. And what's unique about these indicators is that they represent a new democratic rights hard hurdle. So in the new system, the control of corruption hard hurdle remains, and there's a new democratic rights hard hurdle, which says that a country must pass either the political rights or the civil liberties indicator to be considered passing the indicators test. And that's for low income and lower middle income countries. And then finally, the rules of passing have changed. Instead of passing half in each of the categories, a country now must pass half overall. So that's at least um, 10 of the new 20 indicators and one in each category. So a whole suite of new rules, but um, they made some interesting changes and um, the MCA monitor in particular is especially excited about the new indicators as they have um, opened the, pies, um, um, the policy dialogue with countries in these areas, which is exciting. So those are some of the highlights this year. Now, the question is, how does the board make their decisions? So the MCC Board of Directors bases their uh, um, eligibility um, decisions on four um, criteria. The first, as we've already discussed, is indicator um, performance. So how a country um, um, performs on the indicators and what their um, policies are in these different areas. 
The second is the MCC's opportunity to reduce poverty and generate economic um, growth. So this is kind of a nebulous criteria, but it's really interesting because it's speaking to the catalytic effects of the MCC model. So can this country um, take um, the unique MCC model and, and the unique way that MCC makes its investments and have catalytic change in the country? The third, and this is only in the case of um, second compacts, is compact implementation. So in theory, it should be more difficult for a country to achieve a second compact because not only must they um, perform well on the indicators test, but the MCC board of directors also looks at the track record on first compact implementation. So was it on time, on budget, on target, and were ne um, necessary policy reforms implemented? And then finally, and this is, as Connie said, a huge one this year, it's resource availability. So what um, funds does the MCC have and how are they um, choosing to use them? So layered on to these criteria are the MCA monitors guidelines. The first is that while the indicators are of extreme importance, they are not the only guide to how a country's policies are doing. Um, and this I'll get to in a little bit because it, it um, comes in to play with one of our predictions. The second is to be highly selective, and this sounds like an obvious one, but we have, as I've said, the double dynamic of uh, um, extreme lim um, extremely limited resources and the fact that this is the exact time that the MCC is being asked um, to show results. So they have to balance this and make sure that they choose the right countries um, to show those results. The second is a good um, compact partnership record. So here we have access as kind of the development community to the disbursement records of compacts, to if they finished on time, to things like this. But what the MCA monitor really tried to look at is the partnership aspect and how countries implemented policy reforms. So in some compacts, there are necessary policy reforms that must be implemented to make the investments work. So a new law here, a change to a law there. But in some cases, a compact um, country either went um, beyond the compact and instituted new policy reforms not um, dictated in the compact, or took a piece of the compact and then applied it to the um, to the whole government. And so these are things that the MCA monitor thinks are a good indicator of whether a country can take second compact resources and really make them work. And then finally, we're advocating to use the new threshold program. Now is the time to use this new tool at the MCC's disposal. It can do a lot of exciting things in theory, but now we'd like to know if it's um, in practice. And also this is in a sense, a good money saver. It's you're able to to basically to dangle your toes in the water and see if this country um, might be a good compact partner with less um, um, initial resources invested. So, without further ado, the passers. So, as the MCC does, we have broken our analysis down into low income and lower middle income countries. So, I'll start with the low income income countries and move to the lower middle. So what you have here is um, the countries that pass in both systems under only the new system and under only the old system. And these tables are also in the report if it's hard to see. Um, so 11 countries pass both systems and so we can be sure that these are pretty good passers. But what's really interesting is the changes between the old and new. So in the old system, three countries, the Gambia, um, Rwanda and Vietnam are now eliminated under the new system and that's because of the democratic rights hard hurdle. And you'll probably know that these countries have been um, perennial passers but have never actually been um, chosen by the MCC. So now it's basically institutionalized the fact that MCC is paying at, um, attention to the, the democratic rights environment in a country. Under the new system, the majority of the new passers, like Mali, Mozambique, are ones that had failed the investing in people category by one or two indicators. So 
Under the old system, you'll recall you had to pass at least half, or you didn't pass, but under the new system with the half overall rule, these countries did very well in ruling unjustly and um, economic freedom, and so now are new passers. Also, that's been in, too. So, our predictions for the low-income country. Two of these, um, Ghana and Zambia, you'll um, recognize from last year's... Uh, um, Ghana was made eligible in FY11 uh, um, last year as um, a second compact country. It is due to complete its compact in February of this year. It's also a Partnerships for Growth country. So, in terms of an, um, an environment that the MCC has a real chance to um, generate economic um, growth, it's there. It does very well on the indicators test and should be a straightforward reselect this year. Same goes for Zambia. It was actually made eligible in FY10 for its first compact, and it is at the moment in the final stages of, um, its, of, of developing its first compact, and it should be due to sign very soon. Again, Zambia does very well on the indicators test. The two new compact eligible um, countries that um, we are predicting the MCC um, board should select are Benin and Honduras. So Benin completed its first compact in October of this year, on budget, on time, on target. But most importantly, there were a number of difficult um, policy reforms that the government undertook um, to make the compact work. And so in terms of the policy environment, it was very good. And we think Benin is likely to be made um, eligible for a second compact. Honduras is another second compact um, eligible case. It was actually the first country um, to complete its compact in September of, of um, 2010, and it's actually an interesting case this year. So you'll recall I said that the indicators are of importance, but are certainly not the only thing that should be um, looked at. So Honduras um, does extremely well on the indicators test. It passes 16 of 20 indicators, and in terms of its first compact implementation, not only was it on time, on budget, on target, but the policy reforms and the, and the policy environment, um, the MCC team did an amazing job in ensuring a high level of results and that those results were sustainable. The problem is Honduras um, falls in the 47th percentile on the control of um, corruption hard hurdle. Now this score is um, just below the median and it's actually statistically indistinguishable from a passing country. So it's, it's, it's due to the inherent um, error in, in the indicator. And so the, MC, um, the MCA monitor thinks that Honduras' um, corruption score alone is not low enough to warrant exclusion and therefore we think the MCC should make it eligible for a second compact. Under the threshold program, we think Nepal will be made eligible. And this is actually an um, interesting and exciting case. So Nepal actually passes the indicators test and does quite well. But in terms of the policy environment, it's been a little iffy. It's been on an upward track in terms of democratic rights. And it passes the hard hurdle this year, but hasn't in years past. But Nepal is also a feed the future and um, a global health initiative plus country. So these are um, two of um, the presidential initiatives that are ongoing in this country. And so we think this could be an interesting case for MCC to step in and see kind of what the constraints to um, growth analysis might reveal and have a new threshold program here. Under the lower middle income country, again, you'll see both systems, the new system and the old system. It's interesting with the lower middle income countries because the old system and both systems are the same. So it's actually the new system only allows new passers, but it, it, it doesn't um, make any countries move from failing, I mean, from, um, from passing to failing. The new countries, you'll recognize El Salvador and um, Morocco as two compact countries, and they are new passers. Um, the other new ones are, are Kiribati and, um, and Vanuatu, and these only um, pass on the margin, so it's only by like one indicator that they're new passers, so still kind of on the edge, but they do pass under the new system. Our predictions for lower middle income, 
two you'll recognize, um, Kate Faird and Georgia, and our new one is El Salvador. So um, Kate Faird was actually the first country to, to um, be made eligible for a second compact in um, FY10. It's also in the final stages of developing its second compact and will be an easy reselect. It passes the indicators test just fine. And Georgia was also made eligible last year to, um, to develop its second compact. It um, does extremely well on the indicators this year and is currently developing its second compact. Our new prediction for this year is El Salvador. El Salvador is due to complete its compact next year. Um, but perhaps, and it's um, so far on time, on budget, on target. Um, but what's exciting about El Salvador is that it's a partnerships for growth country. And so the Obama administration um, has, has recently signed a joint action plan with the government of El Salvador to initiate this new, um, this new um, initiative, which basically brings to bear all of um, the U.S. government efforts in, in, in development in a, a cohesive um, manner. Um, some will, will wonder if the whole government approach um, works, but it, there are efforts to see if it does um, in these four countries. So those are our predictions. Um, and I know I went um, through this um, fairly quickly, but I wanted to leave ample time for um, questions and answers and I'm happy to go into more depth on, on any um, issues that you're interested in. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kate. So I want to open it up, um, give us some feedback, good or bad. Um, keep in mind that Casey's end of the year bonus uh, relies on whether the MCC board actually picks the countries that she's chosen. Did you know that? No, I don't. I didn't. I didn't. So, <laughs> anyways, so anyone want to jump in with any kind of question, comment? Uh huh. Uh, I'm Sean Casselli. I'm from Synergy International Systems. I'm working with a few MCAs uh, putting together compact monitoring and evaluation information systems, so we're pretty familiar with them. Uh, I, I read the report, a good report. Um, I liked a lot of the predictions on where you thought MC, MCC would get its most bang for its buck. Solomon Islands, things like that. Uh, my question is, uh, do you think there could be a prejudice towards uh, giving uh, second compacts you know, in, in a time of austerity and lower risk, you, fewer startup costs? Could MCC move in that direction in the next few years to try to, uh, to keep money where it already is and avoid new risks? Is that, do you, you see any indication of that? Yeah, so what's important to remember is that when the compact ends, the actual accountable entity is um, disbanded. So in terms of the cost um, between a second and a first, obviously they're less with a second um, because the environment's already there, but not as much as you might think. But I completely agree that now, like the MCC has, has um, kind of made it its name with more bold, more um, risky investments, and if it shies away from that, I do um, fear that it could start to kind of lose its its um, brand name. With that said, a lot of the second compact investments are now like taking the next step in terms of new investments, new exciting things, and so I think there's a fine line between a second compact country but making sure that the investment is still moving forward and still pressing forward. Um, but I definitely think the costs associated with a second compact versus um, a first compact are on the minds of the, of, of the MCC. Let's go up down here and then we'll come up to Larry. Uh, Michael Wallace, yeah. from the Resources Manager, talking about this. Um, great analysis, thank you. It's, it's incredibly helpful to be able to look at that. Uh, two questions. Number one, how have you done in the past? What's the, what's the <laughs> prediction rate versus how likely are you to get that bonus? And second of all, um, in terms of inter inter year process from one fiscal year to the next, uh, there were a couple of countries that had the MCC budget been larger in fiscal 11 uh, would have been on the list of compacts and kind of got pushed aside uh, to a certain degree. And I'm wondering if any of the countries that are in your predictive list uh, were the were those countries that were already farther along, already kind of expecting it for 11, 
that are likely to kind of rise to the top of 12 as the European mm -hmm. So I'm thinking obviously of Zambia, mm -hmm. uh, possibly others. So, mm -hmm. so just like your thoughts on this case. Sure, sure. Um, <coughs> So I'll start with the second and then move to the first. Um, so absolutely with Zambia, I think um, in the, how to say this, um, it was more expedient for the administration to hone in on Indonesia, even though it was um, not necessarily in line, um, but the timing was such that it was a little more fast-tracked um, than Zambia. But the funds for Zambia will actually come out of the FY10 MCC allotment. And so in terms of its kind of obligations, it's set. So now it's just a matter of, of um, finalizing the compact and, and moving forward. But we hear that, yes, I, there might be a little bit um, from 11, but it's mostly 10 money. Um, so, and then in terms of the countries whose like time is due, you'll notice in terms of our new selections, it's only um, Benin, El Salvador and Honduras. So Benin and El Salvador have just um, completed their their compacts, and so Honduras might like be the only country who who would be considered to kind of have their time due, as since they've are now 14 months um, since the closeout of their compact. Honduras? Oh no, they haven't been awarded yet. Yeah, so that's kind of like their time is due now in terms of that, um, maybe. And on the prediction rate, I would say quite successful. We haven't actually run the numbers, but now I kind of want to yeah, see this. Um, where we usually get a little more inventive is with the threshold program. And in the past, we've done a borderline category. So that's been more of um, our, our judgment on if a country will get a compact, but maybe shouldn't, and vice versa. Um, versa, but in terms of the actual compact countries, I think we're we're pretty spot on. Um, yeah, but I can get you numbers. <laughs> no, but now I kind of want to know too. For next year. Yes, exactly, hundred <laughs> percent. Learning also okay, the, the foundation. Um, three quick questions. Although the, on the first one is that there are some of like to know who's the lead here. Uh huh. And now he's gone to MCC. <laughs> yeah. so exactly How much do we talk? Yeah. Stars are. Mm -hmm. um, who gets, should get the biggest bonus? That's fair. Yeah. Um, three quick questions. You answered part of it when you said that it's Honduras, Salvador, and uh, Benin who do not have uh, prior year right. technology set aside for their compact. So, assume a 900 million, mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. appropriation, do you think that will fit the 12 mm -hmm. budget will accomplish? Um, so on the FY12 allocation, um, one of the few things that was actually agreed um, upon between the House and Senate was this 898.5 um, million. So if you think about it in terms of um, Benin, Honduras, and El Salvador, say they got um, 250 each, and that might even be too high because you'll recall um, even the first compacts in, in some of those weren't that high. And then also um, Nepal would fall under this. So that's like say an extra like 50 million. So that's 800 million. Again, not enough to exactly um, include for administrative um, costs because I believe it's about 100 million for um, OE. Oh, yeah. So um, it's definitely doable and the MCC will have to get um, creative in, in um, its allocation. But here I might also mention Malawi. If, um, 
So that's a $350 million compact. Um, I've heard that the board is not going to make any decisions until the March meeting on Malawi. It's going to be only on selection this year. So um, in case you all don't know, um, the Malawi compact is, is currently on an operational hold, not suspended, not terminated, um, um, just a hold. And it had only been signed but not entered in to force. So the, um, the money hadn't actually been obligated yet to start the five-year um, clock. So I, there's, um, you might have seen a new, um, a new memo from the Obama administration on, um, on, on protecting human rights and, and using foreign assistance as a tool to do so. I think um, Mal the onus will definitely um, be on Malawi to show that it has done that. I, I don't think it's, um, it's going to be an easy road, especially with this new mem um, memorandum. But yeah, I would hate to speculate further than that. Um, but yeah, so I'll leave it at that. And then in terms of El Salvador, so, yeah. Which fiscal year is the plan? So it was made eligible in FY10 along with um, Zambia. Yeah, but if if that were to be terminated, then those funds could then be carried over because if because they can carry over back funds, but not um, forward funds. So in terms of opening up new monies, um, that would definitely be potential. Um, yeah, of course. And then on El Salvador, um, yes, the fact that they've already done a constraints to growth through the Partnership for Growth initiative is, um, is I think, definitely a big um, feather in, in their cap. And then to your earlier um, question on how do you conserve resources in this tight environment, they've basically already done the groundwork on the constraints to growth and, and, and um, so then can start immediately in second compact um, development. And so I think the board will absolutely be considering that fact. And two questions back here. Which one of you wants to go first? You can elbow each other out. <laughs> I have a quick question. I think I'll So Indonesia has actually already been signed, and that happened in, in November, and, and Michael did um, a lot of work on it because there's also an interesting um, environmental um, component to, to the compact. Um, <coughs> but in terms of how it does on the indicators... And this year, as I recall, they failed both yeah. systems by... And it's not particularly close either, but again, they've, they've already signed. The compact, it doesn't matter as much this year. It's just, it's an optimist thing. But they fail hugely, yeah. <laughs> especially in yeah on on the hard hurdles on the overall indicators. Um, it's not a good uh, yeah. The optics of it are, are really not good. Um, but they did just sign, so <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. So, my name is Shannon regarding the International Research and Exchange Board. We've been implementing a couple of the special programs in Rwanda. Okay. Nice. So I was interested in your uh, prediction of Nepal and. Uh, First, if you had any sense if Nepal had chosen what the focus of the threshold program would be. Mm -hmm. And second, that if Nepal had chosen, what are some of the other countries that you think might be in the for the chosen Sure, sure. Um, again, as I said, with the new focus on the threshold whole program, it's, it's on um, policy reform writ large. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to be a constraints to growth analysis that det um, determines those policies. And so we can't say yet the actual focus of, of the program. In in prior years, you could look at a country and say, okay, it's failing this indicator, this indicator, and this indicator, MCC will likely work in, in one or more of those areas. Um, but because that's no longer the focus, we actually won't know what um, a threshold program in Nepal would look like until a constraints to growth analysis is, is um, uh, undergone. Um, in terms of if Nepal is not chosen. Um, there are a couple of other countries that are close, um, but quite honestly, we, in terms of kind of the policy 
environment there. Um, none of them spoke to us in, in terms of being worthy of, of this new program. I should also mention that um, um, Tunisia was actually made eligible for a new threshold program in September. So under a left wife, um, FY11 funds, Tunisia, which is a lower middle income country, or was a lower middle income country, um, will also be a new threshold program. So the MCC is working on that one, and um, it's not a passing country. And so we think that um, the MCC should also pilot the revamped um, threshold in a country that has a good and strong policy environment. And so that was our choice behind Nepal. Um, but yeah, none of the other ones we're up there on that list. And I guess I would just add, if you look at the countries that um, passed the indicators this year, uh, we, have the, we have the few that we recommended. Um, a few of the small island nations, which as we said before, might not be get the most bang for the buck. And, and then there are a bunch of other countries that are all in current compact development or may not be picked for. So there aren't that many, even though there are, excuse me, 18 countries that passed the indicators this year, there might not be that many available for, well, there might be a good choice for thresholds outside of Nepal or perhaps a couple others. All the way down at the end? Well, I think I'm, I'm interested in the threshold program and the scope that it has. Um, would it make any sense for a country like the US, um, some other that have already implemented their contract, would it make any sense for MCC to use them for a threshold program? Right. The, the scope. Right. I thought a lot about this, and um, these are my thoughts, um, not attributable to to um, CDD. But um, I would say yes, with caveats. So in the past, a threshold program has been a two to three year endeavor. But I wouldn't. And so if if say if Honduras, um, if the board thought we just can't um, do Honduras because of the hard hurdle, which, as I've said, I think is wrong, but that's neither here nor there, then let's give them a threshold program. Because of the new focus and the new constraints to um, growth analysis that will um, determine the focus, I think the threshold program could be used as kind of a start to a compact. So in terms of identifying these areas, it's obviously a smaller amount of money, but I would say the caveat that I would want is that, okay, so we do this for a year, but when the next um, selection round is is there, if, if we pass this hard hurdle, then we should be made eligible for a compact. So having a, th a threshold program wouldn't preclude Honduras from them having a compact in FY13, if, if, if it's the hard hurdle, that's the only um, issue of optics. So I think there's there's definitely space to get far more interesting, more risky, and, and definitely have some serious funds behind it. Um, but I think both parties would need to kind of make clear their intentions in the intervening year and make sure that having a $50 million um, threshold would then um, preclude uh, a $200 million um, compact. And a quick question just yeah. regarding that very same issue that you just mentioned. Um, I, I do not know how the threshold programs work. Do, is it, you mentioned in your paper that it's sort of like a mini compact. Right. Do funds get transferred to the country and does the country implement the funds? So under, yes, so under the new program, it's it's um, far more in, in the model of, of having it this kind of um, a, um, accountable entity in country because in in the past it had been it's it's been except for I think two of the programs a USAID implemented threshold program but the MCC is um, changing that and so in terms of as I said the diagnostic tools and, and how um, the comp or the the threshold is formed it's a mini compact what's different of course is it's not these large scale investments because it's not, um, there's neither the time or, or the funds, but it's, it's focused on policy reforms to make the policy environment um, right for then a compact, which would be these large scale investments as you've already done. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, first, how, if, if Indonesia did so bad on the indicators, how 
how did how exactly did it get selected for a compact? You know, I might have it, they might have done well in past indicators or something didn't materialize. Is the, and is there a case this year where you could see someone who doesn't do so well in the indicators getting by for strategic uh, considerations? So they, right. So they did well on the indicators when they were selected for the indicators for the for compact, which was last year. FY nine. So two years ago, um, they they did very badly this year on the indicators test, and there's there could be and, and very badly. It's not they were nowhere near the bottom, but you know they weren't, and so it's. I mean, so technically, you know, they, they didn't have to pass the indicators, so that's it fine. No, no, no. And, um, and there's a lot of reasons why they could have looked like they regressed for reasons that might or may or may not have to do directly with Indonesia's policies or some of the new indicators, new entrants. There have been a lot of shifts in income groups in the past few years, countries pulling out or pulling in that changed the medians in a way that could create possibly an artificial result, or maybe they did ju just do very badly, and in any case, it doesn't matter. So, yeah. for, so um, what happened is, in when they were selected, they were a low-income country. Yeah. Um, and then the next year, they were a lower middle, and those medians are much more strict. And so it wasn't necessarily a change in the policy environment, but a change in the medians. With that said, it's been three years, and the scores are still nowhere where I'd like to see. And um, the MCC actually has this like um, interesting rule that says that a country can be considered in its former income category for three years after its um, selection. And so this is the third and final year that Indonesia is, is um, considered in its former category. But even under the control of um, corruption, low income median, it fails. So. One other question. Uh, this might be out of the scope of your paper, but uh, have we seen the end for the time being of these big compacts like Tanzania, like Indonesia, I guess maybe Morocco? Is are things going down? You know, going down in right. terms of funding? Or it, the only way that I don't think that's possible because again, if it's an eight a uh, ninety eight annual budget and you had a, a six hundred million compact, that it's, it's yeah. Um, but the MCC has um, some pending legislation on concurrent compacts. So basically, it, it, it um, says that once a piece of the compact, like say a 300 million piece is ready, it could be funded in FY12, and then a piece of it could be funded in FY13. So I think if the MCC were to get um, the concurrent um, compact authority, then we might still see these um, huge investments. But until that happens, I really don't think so. And I'm also still unconvinced about concurrent um, compact authority. But I think that's the only way to have these huge investments as, as within in, in, in Indonesia. Thanks. Where is that political process? <laughs> um, so it was in authorizing language um, in the Senate um, Foreign Relations Committee. And it's been there for the past three years since I've been at the MCA monitor. Um, and they have never actually passed um, a reauth, so it's never gone through, and it's never been attached um, in appropriations language. There's also some other. It's in the Senate. So there you go. Twelve foreign affairs was one of the six that's actually number three. So maybe it'll happen. Does the House? Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. The House hasn't included the concurrent. No. But not so much into the authorizing. The There's been selective pushback from the Hill on concurrent. You know, it's never really you know, captured the imagination of the entire chamber, but there's just been usually one or two well placed people that were opposed enough to it to just derail it. And that's pretty much what's been happening. So, Todd? Uh, can I ask a uh, general and then a specific question? Generally, what's the What's your sense of the, uh, the Hill's view? I mean, it seems like a couple of the Capitol Hill champions for the MCC are no longer on Capitol Hill anymore. And if you look at these countries, not that many people up there that are going to get too excited about Cape Verde, Benin, and especially in a time of austerity. Uh, so, you know, is MC, where's the MCC? Where are their champions? 
And then the second uh, question is, um, what's the status of Liberia? Um, do you have any insight on that? Or should I go for it. Okay. Um, so I think you're definitely right. A lot of the champions have um, left, which is unfortunate. Um, but I, I think there's still um, a core group there, in, especially on the House appropriation side. Um, both Granger and, and Lowy seem to really understand the model. Um, and I think that's kind of the first step in, in, in being advocates for it. Um, the problem is, in this time of budget austerity, no one is advocating out loud. <laughs> it's um, all behind the scenes. With that said, the fact that 900 million, it's not obviously the originally envisioned $5 billion, um, but in terms of cuts, a lot of other accounts have, have seen far deeper cuts. And so um, is it what we'd like to see? No, but I think there are definitely still advocates for the MCC um, on the Hill, on both the House and Senate side, um, and especially on the Senate authorizing side. Um, in terms of the language that they have, have put out, there's been some some smart stuff on, on how to make the MCC more flexible, more nimble, and more able to do its job. It's just never actually been made um, into law. On Liberia, so Liberia currently is um, is under a um, $15 million um, threshold program that's focused on land rights and access and girls' education. And I believe it's actually just started because it was made eligible two years ago but then they revamped it, and, the, and so they were um, trying to decide if it should be under the new or the old, and it's under the old. So it's like specifically designed to move the indicators on the land rights and access indicator and the girls' primary um, education completion indicator. Um, it's a USAID implemented um, um, threshold program, and I, I believe that the time span is um, two and a half years. But in terms of how, how Liberia is doing on the indicators overall, we're seeing improvements, especially in the ruling justly category, which is exciting. Um, and I believe they were only two indicators away from passing the new system this year. So I think kind of in two to three years that um, Liberia could be a compact contender, assuming things continue on the current How far through the congressional process do they have to be before they can? They could be. They have to finish. No, 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 no. But they, it's um, a country has never been made compact eligible in like in the first year of its um, threshold program. But as with um, Zambia, it was made eligible in the last six months of its um, threshold program, and so it's it it's it, it doesn't um, um, pass the indicators test this year. But next year, it it'll be a year and a half through, so with only a, a year left. And you have to remember that it takes, on average, 18 months to develop a compact, and so there's some serious kind of upfront um, time. So there's definitely um, space to to be developing a compact and closing down a threshold program. Casey, what about your They, so this uh, was an interesting yes. So they were given a threshold program and we're less than halfway through and then we're given a compact. But the compact still hasn't actually entered into um, to force because there have been some problems um, in the government, obviously. Um, but yeah, so that was the exception to the rule there, but uh, I think that was for different reasons. Come back to the lobby for a second. If the board in its March uh, uh, decides to shut down a lot of this program, those funds are fiscal tech funds, but they just, they're zero year funds as the MCC just, just rolls over. Right. So the, the countries that will be eligible for those funds will just be whoever is eligible at the time if it's not retrospective. Whoever's in the pipeline, right. Right, right. Well, I mean, sort of the trivial answer to your question, since we are moving to the new system, there's just going to be more 
candidate countries or there are more countries that pass the indicators test because in a lot of ways the new system is a lot more permissive. You see the seven new countries that pass um, in addition to the old. And then beyond that, I don't know, do you want to talk a little bit more about it? No, no, I think yeah. um, in terms of the overall net um, increase, it's, it's going to be uh, a net increase in countries. Yeah. But again, if, if you look who, who those countries actually mm -hmm. are, um, about, it's about half and half in terms of um, um, countries that the MCC is already partnering with or um, plans to partner with. And then some countries where, um, in our judgment, the MCC's dollar is not um, best spent like in, in the small island nations. But with that said, I think um, a place that the MCC could start to think about is regional compacts, especially in the case of small island nations. Um, so kind of in, in Oceania, um, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's um, something that could happen. But in terms of awarding a compact only to, um, to one country with a population that's like 500 million, it's not, not five, sorry, half a million. <laughs> Um, yeah. Jake. Um, Jake, are you going to say I'd like to return to Honduras for a second. Sure. My understanding is that there's a policy improvement program already in place. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak to the advantages or disadvantages via the threshold program? And is it only different in terms of resources or are they qualitatively different? They are qualitatively different. Um, so the, the, um, the policy implementation program, um, the PIP as it's called, is um, designed to focus on a, um, a single policy area and it's a, um, a smaller amount of money in that area. I believe it's four million, is that right? More or less? Do we know? Okay, so yeah, it's um, a far smaller amount of money. There's no constraints to growth. Um, this actually um, um, came out of the um, the fiscal policy indicator and, and, and how um, Honduras was um, doing there and the fact that with the government um, transition there um, in terms of the budget reporting um, they needed to have that more frequently because I believe the last time um, before the PIP that the budget was made available was in September of 2009 but you can correct me if I'm wrong and add more to that if there's more. What happened is that back in 2009, the crisis, mm -hmm. there, were, there was no budget available. Right. So that's what brought the indicator down. Right. Substantial. Right. And then 2010, 2011, we did manage to have an open budget, but it took some time for the indicator to back up. Sure, sure. So, okay, go ahead. I was actually uh, just going to ask you about the idea of reading. Uh, of all the places uh, that we know some people in ministry of planning of the Solomon Islands. Uh, and uh, we, uh, the last time we spoke to them, they were all excited about being yeah. eligible. They were saying they had all these ideas about you know, maybe they could combine with Vanuatu or someone else. Right. Is that something that you think is just a good idea, or is that something that you could actually see happening? Right. I guess my my view is that the only way Solomon Islands would ever get a compact is in a regional environment. But when you start to think about how that would work in terms of an implementing entity and kind of the investment nature of an MCC compact is are, are these large scale? Yeah, it would have to be um, some extremely creative thinking. So, yeah. And I think the game is just played differently when you're talking about declining resources. And you know, unfortunately, the, the smaller, you know, maybe less impactful um, areas are going to lose out. And I would just add a, a small point that this might this whole discussion might be moot in a year because a lot of these small island nations passed, but they passed with 10 indicators or 11 indicators. So it might take very much for them to tip back into failing indicators. So we're almost at the end of our time, and I, I have one last question, and that is, can you explain the dynamic between the decision by MCC to develop a new set of indicators and then to run them concurrently, and where does that lead us? Are they just test driving the new set, and in 2013, will, will they be down to one uniform set of indicators, and do you have an opinion about whether the new set is an improvement? Sure. I think... Start about the data. Yeah. So, um, 
basically it was a year and a half long review um, to on on developing a new indicator system and the reason behind it was that the MCC wanted to maintain kind of um, its status as the vanguard of, of um, best um, development um, um, practice and so they went through a number of different um, scenarios in in terms of new indicators, new rules, um, and, and what you see before you is, is, is where things um, came out. We have different thoughts on this. So my thoughts are that the new indicators, especially the access to um, credit and then and the gender and the economy indicators are, are really good um, as both indicators and as both um, a point for um, policy dialogue with new countries in, in terms of um, emerging issues in, in the, the development um, sphere. The new rules um, are, I think it remains to be seen, the, um, the merit um, behind them. I, I will say that the MC monitor has long held that there should be, um, if, if the board is not um, going to select a country based on its record in democratic rights, then it should say so. And so the fact that that rule is now in, um, inst institutionalized, um, we're happy about. But on um, the other rules, bless them. Um, I, I mean, on the whole, I think the indicator, the new indicator system is quite good. Um, having on specific things, having 90% as a threshold for immunization makes a lot more sense than just having a median value because 90% is recommended by WHO and it has some sort of actual public health implications. Um, the access to credit is a great thing to have, you know, sort of stuff. Um, I'm particularly a fan of breaking up the national re national resources management indicator, insofar as it was. Because you can and you can see this in this here. If you compare the old system to the new system, some of the countries that fail national natural resources, you can see exactly what they failed. Maybe they failed um, uh, natural resource protection. I think it's called now, or the other ones, or they failed child health, which is still an average of three others. But you know, breaking out these things and always providing more information seems to be an, almost an unambiguously good thing. And as for the rules, yes, I mean it, it's certain. It seems to be better that. Um, especially with the democracy, democratic rights hard hurdle that now it is explicit what was before implicit and now it's all very clear what's happening. Um, uh, the MCA monitor had uh, put out uh, a short note a few months ago suggesting some changes to the indicator system and that's not quite the way that we anticipated but the outcome is essentially the same. So. And we expect to be down to one system I year? Yeah. yeah. So the only reason that the MCC um, is, is running both systems this year is to to um, offer some policy coherence in terms of dialogue with partner countries. So not to just kind of um, change the rules of, of, of the game mid-game, basically. Um, so that's why you have the two systems this year. But in FY13, we anticipate only the new system will be run. Well, thank you. Thank you Casey all. Thank and you tuned we'll uh, when the selections yeah. made we'll have information out on the blog so thank you